the last classic surgical approach for acetabulum fractures we're going to talk about in this OTA lecture series is the extended iliofemoral approach. Um, in the first two slide presentations uh, where I was narrating this uh, particular lecture, I talked about the um, Coker Langenbeck approach first and then the ilioinguinal. So this last one is the extended iliofemoral. Um, this was an uh, approach developed by uh, Letournel. It's based on a standard iliofemoral, which is this otherwise known as the Smith-Peterson approach. And um, it's an extensile approach. Um, it gives simultaneous access to both columns of the acetabulum. So um, it's not used frequently, and you'll see why. Um, it's for transtectal transverse um, uh, with posterior wall or uh, transtectal T-shaped fractures. So by that meaning if you have a fracture involving the dome of the acetabulum, Letronel at least taught that um, uh, because the reduction was so critical, uh, he felt that um, simultaneous exposure of uh, the anterior and posterior columns was really important. So he would do an extended ephemeral if you had a transtectal transverse uh, with posterior wall or transtectal uh, or, or T-shaped fracture where with one approach you're not going to be able to, to comfortably um, control both uh, anterior and posterior columns. Um, if there's a transverse fracture with an extended posterior wall you possibly may need to use this. Um, that is if you have a posterior wall that you just can't even get with a um, Coker Langenbeck and trochanteric flip and it just keeps going. Um, uh, this is potentially an approach you can consider. I think uh, that's a scenario where you can also consider what's called a triradiate approach, which is something you can actually convert a Coker Langenbeck to. Um, but anyhow, um, T-shaped fractures with wide separation of the vertical stem of the T, or those with associated pubic symphysis dislocations, um, is a possible um, uh, indication for this. Uh, certain associated both column fractures um, and associated fracture patterns that are old. So at least in Letronel's textbook, they separate everything between less than 21 days and greater than 21 days since injury. Um, and it seemed that that was at least their cutoff point where outcomes changed dramatically and the way they dealt with fractures changed also. Um, and again, it's an extensile approach, so it allows you to you know, mobilize a little bit more uh, by, and visualize everything at the same time, more so than with a single approach, or with a single non-extensile approach. Um, so indications for uh, this in both column fractures are inability to reduce the posterior column through the ilioinguinal. Okay, so perhaps a uh, segmental uh, posterior column fracture or just, you, you, you know, it doesn't look like you're going to be able to reduce that uh, through the ilioinguinal approach, although we showed earlier that ilioinguinal does give you some exposure of the posterior column. Uh, if you have very wide displacement at the, at the rim, uh, if you have complex posterior column involvement, like I just mentioned, like a, like a segmental posterior column, um, if you have associated SI joint disruption, um, perhaps, um, if you have a small posterior wall component that needs to be reduced, so not just some non-displaced posterior wall, but you know, a real posterior wall uh, that, that you need to get after. Uh, so see, these are some of the fracture types you may need to do an extended iliofemoral on. This uh, approach gives you access to the external aspect of the ilium, and you'll see it gives you quite an amazing view of the external aspect of the ilium. It does give you some anterior column uh, exposure as far as the uh, beetle is the iliopectinal eminence. You really don't get all the way across the pubic symphysis very easily with this, uh, especially you know, in, to some degree because of how, how much you have to position the patient, if anything. Um, it gets you to the posterior column, at least at the upper ischial tuberosity. So here's kind of what you can see. So uh, the majority of it is an external uh, approach, and if you can imagine the, you know, the surgical incision kind of, at least the classic lateral surgical incision kind of follows, you know, this type of upward, uh, upside down or candy cane or upside down J or candy cane shaped incision. So you can imagine when you do this, and then you, know, you sort of uh, you know, reflect everything this way, uh, you're going to get wide exposure of the uh, external. Uh, 
uh, part of the pelvis or the outer table, but you can also elevate, just like in the ilioinguinal, you can elevate the abdominal muscles off and get some exposure uh, down here as well, and then if you have to, some, some digital exposure down here. Um, it, you place the patient in the lateral position for this. Okay, so on a traction table, uh, you would position it this way. Uh, you can also do this on a radiolucent uh, table. Um, here's an example of the fracture position on a traction table. Um, this is the approach. Okay, so I said it's like a sort of like an upside down uh, J or a candy cane. Uh, it's an inverted J incision. Uh, there are some modifications of this, but let's, we'll just stick with the classic uh, Letronel approach. Um, the um, incision kind of goes parallel to the iliac crest from PSIS to ASIS, uh, and then you go along the anterior uh, thigh. You release the uh, origin of the gluteals and tensor fascia lata from the iliac crest. All right, so you basically take all the abductors and the tensor muscle off of the iliac crest. You subperiosteally dissect the iliac wings. You're exposing the entire outer table. You go um, all the way around towards the greater sciatic notch, and then you incise the fascia lata uh, to the end of the muscle belly. So you 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 cut the fascia as well. Um, here's so uh, head is this way, feet are this way. Okay. Um, and uh, this is posterior, and this is anterior here. Sorry. Um, so here's your, your sort of inverted J incision. Here you can see the um, tensor fascia lata muscle uh, has been elevated. The fascia here has been incised, right? This is the tensor fascia uh, lata that's been incised here. And here's the outer table. Okay, and we're now starting to make our way down towards the greater sciatic notch. Um, you retract the tensor fascia lata muscle posteriorly. Okay, so let's just go back here. So uh, here's the muscle. The muscle is going to be retracted posteriorly. You incise the sheath of the rectus femoris. You ligate the femoral, the like the ascending branches of the lateral femoral circumflex arteries. Okay, so that's shown here. So the same J incision, uh, just like with the Smith Peterson. You're going to find that. Um, ascending branches of the lateral femoral circumflex. You're going to ligate those. Here's shown from a different orientation. Now remember, we, we released the abductors off of the pelvis. Now you release the tendons off the greater trochanter. So pretty much you've taken the muscle off its origin and insertion. So it's really just hanging on by its neurovascular pedicle coming from the greater sciatic notch. Now, alternatively, you can do an osteotomy, and some people have even done an osteotomy of the iliac crest and an osteotomy of the uh, greater trochanter. So you have, rather than tenotomies, you do osteotomies. But it, you know, it's it's a, just a slight difference in technique. The intervals otherwise are very similar. Uh, so as I mentioned, you rotate all those muscles pedicled on the superior gluteal artery. Okay, so you better make sure the superior gluteal artery is working. And some people will say you should get an arteriogram before you do this approach in case the superior gluteal artery is out and you're relying on some collateral circulation. You're going to take down all that collateral circulation. So uh, you don't want to end up with, with a situation of uh, flap necrosis later on. Hard to really see here, um, but basically you've you know, taken the tendons off. Uh, here you can see, to the, here's the tenotomy. Uh, the uh, abductors off of the uh, off of the femur. Uh, you've seen everything's already taken off of the um, pelvis. You have a retractor here, all right, in the sciatic notch, probably. Okay, and everything's being reflected posteriorly. Again, this is a cadaver. The tissues are not good, but this is all the this is all the um, uh, the ilium and the hip joint's going to be it's going to be here. Okay. So you're going to incise and retract the piriformis tendons. Now it's almost like you're back there where you're doing a posterior approach to the to the pelvis, right? Like a Coker Langenbeck almost. Uh, you're going to incise and retract the piriformis tendon, the obturator internus uh, tendon with the gemelli muscles. Okay, you're going to put the sciatic nerve uh, retractor in the lesser sciatic notch. You're going to protect your sciatic nerve. Do a capsulotomy if required. I mean, I think if you're doing this approach, you want to see the joint. So I, I would suggest you do a capsulotomy. This way you can 
you can sort of retract the femur distally, you can traction it with a traction pin, and you can really see not only the fractures in the iliac wing, but you can actually look at the fracture in the joint itself. Okay, here you can see a nice example of the femoral head being distracted. Okay, so here's a capsulotomy here, right? And then the femoral head is being distracted, and now you can kind of see into the acetabular fossa, okay? If internal iliac fossa ex exposure is required, you can do this like you do for a lateral window. Elevate the abdominal muscles from the iliac crest. Elevate the iliacus subperiosteally. Release the sartorius and inguinal ligament from the ASIS, um, which uh, I didn't mention before. That's not something you have to do for the ilioinguinal. You can do it for an expanded, um, uh, it's sort of an ex it's Smith-Peterson extension of the ilioinguinal, but this uh, this step here is something that gives you additional anterior exposure if you're doing an ilioinguinal of the um, like the anterior wall um, of the acetabulum, um, uh, and then anyhow continuing on, you, you you can preserve the anterior capsule and direct head of the rectus for blood supply to the anterior column. So complications, uh, really the big one is. Um, uh, heterotopic ossification, you're taking all the muscles off the outer table. And HO tends to occur a little bit more when you elevate muscles off the outer table than when you elevate muscles off of the inner table. So you really have to strongly consider prophylaxis for these patients. There are other extensile approaches. I, I did mention this uh, this one earlier, the triradiate. I think that it's a nice uh, conversion approach. So for instance, if you're doing a Coker langenbeck and uh, remember, Coker Langenbeck approach is like this. So let's just say this is the troke. This is the PSIS, right? So this is this is distal. This is proximal. You do the you know you post your approach. Anterior is this way, right? Uh, and let's just say you know your 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 acetabulum, your femoral. You, you have this posterior wall fracture, and it extends up here, and you do your trochanteric flip, and you're still just not. You just, there's, maybe the abductors are too big, the patient's very muscular, you can't get here, but the fracture comes all the way to here. Well, you can do the triradiate. Okay, remember the pelvis is like this. You can essentially ex make another incision in the skin. Okay, uh, now you have a triradiate. And then what you do is you incise the uh, tensor fascia lata. Um, Sometimes you have to do it obliquely so that uh, it doesn't retract out of control um, if you need to repair it in a slightly lengthened position. But this now, you do your trochanteric flip, you bring it up this way, and uh, now you have your, your uh, even better exposure of that supraacetabular region. Okay. A modified extensile lateral approach can also be done. You can do the extended iliofemoral with osteotomies. Like I mentioned before, instead of tenotomies, you can just osteotomize everything. It's just a modified technique, and the incision can be placed a little bit differently. Um, now, I've, t I've mentioned these uh, three approaches, right? The cochra langenbeck the ilioinguinal, the extended iliofemoral, but you can do uh, combined approaches. Um, instead of doing extended iliofemoral, uh, you can do a cochra langenbeck and an ilioinguinal. Um, you can try to do them at the same time if the patient body habitus allows you and put a so-called floppy lateral position. Or you can do sequential approaches either at the same surgery or two different surgeries. Um, if you try to do them simultaneously, the positioning kind of compromises each one, but if you have both approaches open at the same time. It allows you to, to, to sort of manipulate from both directions. Um, one thing you have to be careful of is that if you do a posterior approach first, for instance, that you don't box out your anterior reduction, right? So what that means is that if you're placing screws from posterior into the anterior column, that you, and now you're planning to go anteriorly, uh, you can block your anterior reduction. So if you're going to do two approaches, do one approach, treat that side, and then don't try to indirectly in reduce and fix the other side. Go to the other side and fix the other side. So if you're planning to do two approaches, keep your fixation separate. Um, you know, in rare cases, you may need to do combined approaches if you have a T-shaped fracture that you're unable to reduce the anterior column from a post from a Coker Langenbeck um, uh, anterior wall. Posterior hemi transverse uh, is you know uh, is something where you know if the hemi transverse component is segmental um, or widely displaced, you know that anterior column posterior hemi transverse. I said the 
post your column usually is not that displaced. Uh, in rare cases it may be, or maybe something segmental that you can't get good control from the anterior approach. So you may have to combine surgical approaches. All right, so that's the classic surgical approaches to the acetabulum. Um, I think that's a lot of information for you, but I hope this was helpful. Thanks.